Okay, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us at Mechanics Institute online for our program, Bohemians West, Free Love, Family, and Radicals in 20th Century America, with author Sherry L. Smith in conversation with Dr. Peter Blodgett of Huntington Library of San Marino, California. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at the Mechanics Institute. The opening of the 20th century saw a grand cast of radicals and reformers fighting for a new America. And in the thick of this heady milieu were Sarah Bard Field and Charles Erskine Scott Wood, two aspiring poets. Self-declared pioneers of free love, Sarah and Erskine exchange, exchanged hundreds of letters that charted a new kind of romantic relationship and their personal pursuits frequently came into contact with their deeper engaged political lives. Sarah also became a star of the suffrage movement, culminating in her making a cross country car trip in 1915 and gathering hundreds and thousands of, of, of signatures for the petition that went to Congress. Charting a passionate and tumultuous relationship that spanned decades, Bohemians West offers a deeply personal look at a dynamic period in American history. And also, if you're new to uh, Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854, and we're one of San Francisco's most vital literary and culture, cultural centers that's in the heart of San Francisco. We have an incredible, vast library, uh, international chess club, and ongoing author and literary programs, and of course, our Friday night cinema lit film series. So please visit our website, the building is closed, but you can also get books uh, to be picked up to go. So please get your books online and come pick them up at the front door. This talk uh, will also be followed by a Q&A. So if you have questions for our guests, please hold them and put them in the chat at the end. Um, and Sherry's book, Bohemians West, will be on sale at alexanderbook.com. Now I'd like to introduce our guests. Sherry L. Smith is the University Distinguished Professor of History Emeritus at Southern Methodist University, a historian of the American West and a Native, America, Native America. Smith's award-winning books include Hippies, Indians, and the Fight for Red Power, and also Reimagining Indians, Native Americans Through Anglo Eyes, 1880 to 1940. She is former president of the Western History Association and received the Los Angeles Times Distinguished Fellowship at the Huntington Library, which supported research for Bohemians West. Smith has also been honored with fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Fulbright Foundation, and Yale University. And she has a dual life in Moose, Wyoming and Pasadena, California. And our other guest tonight is Dr. Peter Blodgett. He is the H. Russell Smith Foundation Curator of Western American History at the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. Since joining the Huntington in 1985, he has overseen the library's collection of history of the Northern, North, West, North American West from 1800s to the present. And Blodgett has spoken and published widely on the national parks, tourism and recreation, as well as the management of all of the manuscripts and archives. In his most recent projects, um, they've included Geographies of Wonder, two consecutive exhibitions on Americans' national parks, and also edited a volume called Motoring West, Volume 1, Automobile Pioneers, 1900 to 1907, no, sorry, 1909. And that's published by the University of Oklahoma Press. So please welcome Sherry Smith, author of Bohemians West and Dr. Peter Blodgett. Thank you, Laura, for that wonderful introduction. I am so sorry I cannot come to see your beautiful library. I'm hoping one of these days to, to come and see it. I've seen photographs of it and it looks absolutely stunning. But in the meantime, I'm so appreciative of your willingness to host uh, this evening's event. And I'm uh, equally uh, appreciative of Pam, who's working behind the scenes to help this all work. And of course, my good friend, Peter Blodgett, 
to join me from the Huntington Library. So I'm envisioning this as a conversation uh, between me and Peter because we've known each other for many years and Peter knows a good deal about these characters uh, as well. So um, uh, I'm just really looking forward to it. And it's certainly uh, a phenomenal pleasure for me to undertake this conversation. Um, having had such a long and productive friendship with Sherry, uh, enjoying the opportunity each time she's come to the Huntington to do whatever I can to assist her in the course of her research. And I think it's, it's particularly appropriate that an institution like the San Francisco Mechanics Institute Library is hosting us this evening because I, I think it's true that certainly for me as an employee of libraries, but also Sherry as a frequent flyer in the use of them uh, to have such a setting in which to convene our discussion. Uh, I wanted to make sure to try and get us off to a productive discussion. So I have a couple of questions in my back pocket, um, but I'm hoping very much as Sherry suggests that our conversation will unfold as we move across the uh, fascinating story that Sherry has put together in this absolutely splendid uh, piece of writing. Uh, and so I guess I would start us off by asking Sherry how and where did you first encounter Sarah Bard Field and CES Wood? Well, um, these are two people that most of the listeners here, I assume, probably do not know. And they're not uh, particularly well-known literary figures or historical figures. So it is a good question. How did I find them and why did I want to write about them? So the answer to that is that a long time ago, I was working on a dissertation on US Army officers and their personal reflections on fighting Native American people. And that brought me into the orbit of Charles Erskine Scott Wood. And Pam, if you wanted to um, show the first slide, I have a picture of him as an, a young army officer in 1877. And he particularly interested me. I was looking at any officer I could. There's uh, Erskine on the, these are two pictures of Erskine. But this is Erskine, the army officer on the left. Um, I, was, I looked at 150 different officers, but he really stood out because he was so, first of all, handsome, what can I say? <laughs> but also so interesting, um, as, a, as it turned out, a very reluctant soldier. His father made him go to West Point. And so he ends up in the army where he did not want to be. In his heart of hearts, he thought he should be a poet. Uh, you know, and so there he was, fighting Indians with whom he sympathized. And in fact, at the end of the Nez Perce War, he befriended Chief Joseph and sent his own son, not to West Point, as his father had sent him, but instead to live with Chief Joseph. So this was a remarkable um, army officer, uh, and it was interested in him. So it turns out that the Huntington Library had some of his papers, including his diaries from the Nez Perce War. But it's a huge collection. Peter, how many boxes are there altogether in the Wood Collection? I think we were, I think that collection runs to over 300 boxes just in the main part of the collection, and that's not including other things that we can talk about later. Okay, so I saw the uh, finding aid, <clears throat> and I noticed that there are all these boxes of, of letters uh, to this woman and from this woman named Sarah Bard Field, and I could not help myself but want to know what is that about? So I actually re you know, requested one of those boxes, and I discovered dipping into those letters that this was an affair that began really when they met in 1910. And it lasted for many, many years. And so there were over a thousand, a couple thousand letters that they wrote just to each other. And I, you know, it was just so fascinating. It was just drawn in immediately, but I wasn't there to be studying that. So I had to put it aside. And so I said to myself though, someday I'd love to go back and, and see uh, if I can make a story, if there's a story to be told about this actually. And so uh, that is how I discovered both of them. And it was a number of decades later before I was able to actually go back and read all of those letters. And it took me a while to do that and to read the letters they wrote to their own spouses and their 
of the other person's spouses and their children and the many, many famous people that they knew along the way as well. So I, um, that's how I discovered them. Now this is a photograph of Wood in 1877. Some people look at that and think, oh, he looks like a callow lad. Um, others think, hmm, he looks kind of, you know, interesting. And he had, as you can see, a great deal of confidence even as a young man. The other photograph is C.E.S. Wood in 1918. He and Sarah met in 1910. So um, he looked more like the fellow on the right by the time Sarah met him. So we can go on to the next slide and just so you can get a glimpse of what Sarah looked like. So he was the person that kind of drew me in, but she was the one who kind of captured my, my interest in the end because she was um, the one who actually changes over the course of the, con of the correspondence and of the relationship. So the, I love this, this, these two pictures because the one on the right is the first photograph that Sarah gave Erskine and she calls it librarily yours. And I, I guess what she meant by that, what she appears to be, not unlike people's stereotype of what a librarian looks like. She was not a librarian. She was in fact the uh, wife of a Southern Baptist minister, but uh, this was her, her first photograph that she gave him. The one on the left is one that was actually, okay, the, the, uh, the two um, captions are actually switched around. The one on the left, was taken about six years later. And I, I love the contrast because, you know, she really changed tremendously in those six or seven years between the time she first met him, where she appears to be a very proper and prim, tightly woven uh, woman. And then the other one, her hair is sort of let down and she's much more relaxed in her dress. And she has really become a, a very different person uh, in this in this photograph that's on the left. So those are the, the central characters and I met I met them at the Huntington Library. And happy we are that you did because okay. it's, it's been such a productive um, encounter both um, in terms of what you've drawn from them but also what you've told us about them as well. Uh, to elaborate a bit on that then I guess I'd, I'd next ask what aspects of either their individual characters or their individual experiences really captivated your interest as you became more familiar with them? Well, as I may have hinted, both of them were actually married to, they were married when they met. Um, and so I knew right away this was not your uh, sort of typical um, traditional and acceptable love affair uh, for 1910. And they met when Clarence Darrow came to town. Now, Wood had been living in Portland for quite some time. After the army, he became a lawyer and he went back to the Northwest and he had five children, uh, six, actually one died quite young, but five children with his very lovely wife. Um, and he was uh, quite the character, uh, not only because of, um, his uh, prominence socially, but also politically. He was a self-described philosophical anarchist, by which he meant that, I guess he would be closest now to what we would call a libertarian, but he believed that individual freedom was the most important uh, value in his life. And he felt that his whole life, he had been sort of doing what his father wanted him to do, and then he got married and he had to be, you know, you know help, take care of his family. and. All he ever really wanted to do was to be a poet. So he really felt that he'd been repressed by circumstance and so on and so forth. And he was really aching to be free. And in the end, that meant including free of the uh, restrictions of marriage. So he was a philosophical anarchist. He was a huge supporter of labor, uh, free speech, anti-imperialism. Um, he didn't talk about civil rights so much, but certainly human rights. He was concerned about Native American rights. And finally, he was an advocate, an outspoken advocate of free love, even though he remained in this marriage um, with Nanny. So uh, he was a lawyer. He knew Clarence Darrow, presumably from the law. I don't really know where they ever met. Clarence, so, and Sarah um, also had, she had a, a rather firm patriarchal father, almost tyrannical. She presents him as a not very loving father. She had hoped to go to college. Um, her older sister, Mary, I did go to college and when she went to the University of Michigan, she came home and their father was also actually a Baptist and, you know, very um, 
very committed Baptist, and Mary began to sort of revolt against her father's uh, theology and ideas, and so he did not want his next daughter, Sarah, to go off to college and have the same thing happen. So he told her she could only go to um, a college in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which was unbaptist affiliated, and she didn't want to do that. So instead, what did she do? She married a man who was a Baptist minister. So you know, that was her idea of revolt. Anyway, they went off to Burma, she came back, but she was getting involved herself in politics, particularly progressive politics. And that's how she met, she met Clarence Darrow in that context. But the other part of this is that Clarence Darrow was her sister Mary's, well, they were having a love affair. So her sister Mary was Clarence Darrow's mistress. So this gets, you know, um, okay. So, uh, her husband, Reverend Ergot, is called out to Portland uh, to take up a church, and um, Sarah is telling Darrow, I don't know what I'm going to do. Portland seems so far away. She thought it was a provincial, boring place. He said, don't worry. Uh, I know a man there who I think you will like, and it was, of course, Wood. So when he came to Portland in 1910, he invited Sarah and her husband and Wood to dinner, and that's how the two of them met. And so that kind of sets up, I think, a lot of things about this story that are, you know, that I couldn't help but be drawn to. I'm not quite ready to, to go to this one, but we can, um, get up, I think we should stay there, right? Thanks, Pam. Um, so, so, so all of, you know, from the very beginning then, this is going to be a, an interesting love affair. Um, they share a great deal. They share political points of view. They share a love of poetry. They share a feeling that they had been uh, kept from being their true selves by, again, circumstance and so on and so forth. So they were drawn to one another. And um, they were, the, the letters are just incredible. They're very long, they're very rich. I was amazed at how they were different. Every single one of them was different. So I was never bored and I thought, oh, not this again. Uh, so it's a combination of who they were before they met, how they met, and then this rich, incredible um, archive uh, that allowed me to not only see the beginnings of this, but how it unraveled over time. They were not producers of, oh yes, the weather's lovely, you know, uh, Kay is, you know, off to school today, and, you know, we're, we're going to the opera tonight kind of letters, were they? No, they were not. I mean, they were extremely introspective. Some would say narcissistic. Um, <laughs> but we, they, we could never say such a thing, right? Thing, right. But um, they, were, they, they were quite aware that what they were doing would not be considered appropriate by many people. Um, so some of their letters read as if they are trying to justify and explain themselves. Uh, and their behaviors and the choices that they're making. So they were, they were intellectuals, both of them were intellectuals, they were thoughtful, they were um, deep thinkers, and they were often apart. So they had a lot of opportunity to try to talk about the things that were most important to them. And that included politics, that included their families, it included what they thought they were doing, and actually fairly early on, this is I think very interesting, Erskine told Sarah, to keep every letter because he said, I believe we are pioneers in free love. What we are trying to do here is we are trying to create something new and different. And by the way, by free love, he meant love that was sanctioned by neither church or state, you did not need to have that sanction. All you needed was the love itself and it should be freely given. And if over time, it dissipates, then you should be free to separate. So freedom, liberation, I mean, these are all the, the words that matter to him a great deal. So um, the letters then deal with lots of issues of consequence. And then of course, they also deal with the issues that develop in the relationship itself. One of the uh, things that I think you're most successful in doing is, um, a series of pithy characterizations that that really um, foreground some of the essential aspects of what's happening in the course of the book, both, as you just so well put it, the larger uh, social political context and also the interiority, if I can make up such a word, uh, of the relationship. One of the the 
phrases I was most struck by um, is something early in the, the book, in the introduction, in which you say, for all its light and joy, their affair cast long shadows. I, as you read through the book, you're constantly, I'm constantly drawn back to that remark. Would you sketch out a bit uh, of the, you know, the, the type of shadows that we're talking about, how the, it's casting and over whom? Yes, that's a big part of the, the story that I wanted to tell. And, it, and they provided me with a lot of evidence to tell that story. And the point here is that this is not simply an affair between two people and how they felt about each other and mm -hmm. what they did for each other and sometimes to each other. They were both very much you know, nested in families. And so when they chose to pursue this relationship and for a while, for quite a while actually it was secret, at least Sarah's husband didn't know about it, but certainly Erskine's wife knew that he was not only an advocate of, pre, of free love, but a practitioner of free love before he ever met Sarah. So um, I really wanted to tell the story as widely as I could in terms of the networks in which they operated. So in terms of the family, um, unfortunately, Nanny, uh, Erskine's wife, did not write letters about this. So I do not really have her perspective. All I have is what he was telling me she said, and I didn't always think I could trust him. Um, Reverend Ergot did write letters and uh, to Sarah and to Erskine. So I was able to hear firsthand from him how incredibly painful this was for him, of course. You know, he was, he was a wonderful man in many ways, extremely supportive of Sarah. He understood she was an intellectual woman who needed to get outside the home. And so he was encouraging her to do, to do that, including to work for Wood uh, as his literary editor. He supported her in the women's suffrage movement. He was a Christian socialist. So they shared, um, she saw herself as a socialist. They shared many political values. He did everything he could really to give her a, a home and they had two small children besides. So um, I wanted to pursue as much as I could what this did to the spouses. And I also wanted to pursue what it did to the children. And um, interestingly, uh, as I mentioned, Sarah's children were quite young. I should have this at the top of my, at the tip of my tongue, and now I can't remember, but I want to say her daughter was four and her son was seven or something like that. So they're really kid, really small children. And Erskine's children were older. In fact, they were married and he was a grandfather, uh, yet very tightly connected to their father. He was a generous, wonderful man. Um, and so he was a very important person to his children too. So I was able to, through this long um, saga, find letters from the children as well and uh, what they're saying about the children before the children are writing letters. So it provided me with an opportunity to look at what infidelity can do to both spouses and to children. So that's where the pain is sometimes most searingly represented. Uh, I think nobody better than Rever Reverend Aragon really con conveys the deep pain of that <clears throat> and also the anger as it turns out. Uh, in terms of they also hurt each other um, so there's that as well. So I'm um, not sure if I've answered your question, but that's, that's, those are some of the shadows. Some of the shadows. That's exactly what I was thinking of. And it, it leads very nicely into the, the question of how the personal is so inextricably intertwined with the political or the professional in your telling of the account, there's really very little space sometimes between those lives. And I'd be interested to um, hear you speak a bit about their, their personal political passions and the intersection that develops between those passions over time. Okay.
Yes, I mean, their political lives were extremely important to both of them, and they were very much integrated into their personal experiences in a personal relationship. Now, Peter, you have frozen. Are you, can, am I, are others still hearing me? You're fine, Sherry, go ahead. Okay, okay, great. Um, what, they, what they wanted to do as individuals and as a couple was they were part of this radical movement in the early 20th century to change the world. And so they wanted to change the, the, the broader world. They wanted to, to bring into the American economic system uh, greater equality and you know, both of them super supportive of labor, particularly even the radical elements of labor. Um, they also wanted to remake the marriage and family. So, and that was a, not only a personal sort of goal in their own lives, but a larger goal of what they thought they were going to be these are the pioneers in this new way of, of creating love relationships and, and homes uh, and families. So really the political and personal, which we often associate with the women's movement of the 70s, you know, the, the personal is political and vice versa, absolutely prevails here. And on almost everything, the two of them were in agreement about what their position was and what they thought the solutions were to create you know, better lives for people and better uh, families and love relationships and that sort of thing. But the one, and this will allow me to talk a little bit about this slide. One area where Sarah becomes incredibly involved is the women's suffrage movement, particularly related to the uh, 19th Amendment. Now, Sarah was a, a feminist and she was a suffragist but she really wasn't drawn into activism until 1912. And this is when she and Wood had been having this affair for about a year, but she's still living with Reverend Ergot. And um, she is looking for something to do to provide her with a, a profession and a possible living because she's planning to leave Ergot. And she's also hoping to keep the kids. And if she can prove to a court that she uh, is a fit mother, and that she can support her children, that's to the good. So what happens is she's, she's invited by a very good friend to join the Oregon suffrage movement in 1912. At this point, it's still the state by state process that's, that's happening here. And so she um, is traveling all over the, the state of Oregon, trying to convince men to enfranchise women in the uh, election of 1912. And in the course of that, she discovers that she's really good at this. And she was a, a very skilled orator. She, was, um, she could change the message to the audience. Um, she was uh, just very successful. Uh, not only did suffrage pass, but she gained confidence that she could, you know, she really does have some skills here that can be translated into uh, more political activism. She finally, at the end of this, of that year left, she had told Ergot that she no longer loved him, that she was going to uh, leave the home and that she was eventually planning to be with uh, Erskine Wood, but she left and went down to California. And so while the other issues are being resolved, divorce and so forth, she finally finds herself back in the suffrage movement in 1915, when there is a wonderful Panama Pacific Exposition in San Francisco, and the National Women's Party, which is one of the suffrage organizations, decides to have a booth there and have a petition where they will ask particularly Western women who already have the vote to sign a petition demanding the 19th Amendment be created and ultimately passed by Congress. So Sarah was hired to sort of man this booth at the Panama Pacific Exposition. And at the end of that, Alice Paul, who had started this women's party said to Sarah, I think you should take this petition now. And they claimed it was four miles long, with thousands and thousands of signatures. And again, the point was for Western women voters to demonstrate to Congress and to President Wilson, we have power and we want to use our power to push this amendment. But Alice Paul's idea was, why don't you take it to, to Congress, but take it by car. And, and so th this is the car. And there's two women standing to, the, um, to Sarah's left are the two Swedish American women who purchased this car in California and offered to drive Sarah and another woman who dropped out uh, across the continent to deliver this petition to Congress. So this was a phenomenal uh, thing to do. I mean, there, first of all, women in driving was, you know, people didn't, many people didn't think women were capable of driving. Uh, secondly, uh, Sarah was not gonna drive, <clears throat> excuse me. There were no maps. Um, 
But to make a long story short, they did get in this car and they did make it all the way across uh, the country. <clears throat> now, at this point, Erskine was still supportive of women's suffrage. But as Sarah got more involved in the Women's Party, Erskine was disagreeing with some of the tactics that they were using. Particularly in 1916, the, um, the National Women's Party tried to get every woman voter to vote only for candidates who would support the amendment and come out publicly in support of it. And anybody else who didn't want to support the amendment, they should not vote for. So they were making that the single issue of their, their day. And um, they were hoping that it would work, particularly that Wilson would not get reelected because he had not come out in favor, would not publicly support the amendment or use any political muscle he had to, to push it forward. And Erskine thought that was a really bad idea. Uh, he, he was a philosophical anarchist, but he also was a pragmatist, and he, so he, didn't get in, he got involved in politics, and he was a big Wilson supporter. And in 1916, he thought the war was a more important issue, and that Wilson had promised to keep us out of the war, and um, that, that more women were actually going to vote for him in favor of that position than against him because he wasn't coming up with any amendments. Well, this led to a great deal of go back and forth between Sarah and Erskine. For the first time, they were on different sides of a political issue. And earlier in their relationship, Sarah would always sort of bow down to him and defer to him. And he was the wiser, the more politically experienced, the smarter, whatever. But by this time, she has really come into her own. She has found her own voice. She knows who she is. She believes fervently in her principles and in what they were trying to do. And so she begins to write to him, I'm bigger than you, you know, I'm bigger than you. I am much more committed to these issues that are really going to bring the vote in this case to a lot more people and what's the matter with you? Um, so there was that, but, but this below that was also her anger with him because he had not left Portland yet and come to join her. This is, you know, six, seven years after they met. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they begin to come apart uh, at this. And it looks like they might even break up, uh, not so much over the political issue as the personal stuff. But, but that's the, the one point where you can really see a turning point. And she has grown in self-assurance and, and grown in confidence. And that changes the nature of their relationship as well. So the politics and the personal are intertwined all the time. Well, I think that's, that's particularly obvious um, at a point when you are discussing this very process. It's in the, I think, the latter years of the, the relationship between the two when they are not physically together. And you mentioned um, Sarah at, at one point coming to uh, display a steely-willed resolve to get what she wanted. And, you know, clearly that becomes tied in with her, what, psychological, personal, but also political blossoming during the involvement with suffrage, at least so I would, I would say. Yes, yes, ab absolutely. That's, that's what I've been trying to argue, what I try to argue. And um, now I guess I should say, uh, she had really leaped off the edge when she left her husband and left Portland and any sort of security. Uh, she lost her children, frankly. Uh, she had given up a lot for this relationship and would, as far as she could tell, hadn't come anywhere close to doing what she had done. And uh, his reason, I will say, was that he was waiting for this huge windfall from a big case that had been going on for many years he did not feel he could leave Portland in his law practice until he got this huge windfall so that he could create very robust trust funds for his wife, who would never divorce him, and for his grown children. And so um, that was what he was saying. I cannot go. I cannot come to you until that happens. So he was always pretty honest about that, but it was frustrating for her. So in the meantime, she is, she is uh, in, involved in this movement in the company of incredible women. I mean, she got incredible support from women, some of them who thought she was crazy to hang on and wait for Erskine. But that's the thing about her. This was what mattered to her most. 
She cared about suffrage, but what she really wanted in life was to live with Charles Erskine Scott Wood because she believed that they were true soulmates and that um, the greatest happiness would come to her and to him uh, as a couple. So she did not give up. Uh, and ultimately she did uh, actually get what she wanted. And so we do have a, a, another slide, I think, that maybe shows the two of them. And uh, as it turned out, World War I was the thing that actually led to the resolution of the, of the legal case. And Wood finally did get this huge windfall in 1918. And so by the end of 1918, he did leave Portland. Although his family didn't completely understand that he wasn't planning to come back. He wasn't completely forthright with them about that. But he did come to live uh, with her uh, in San Francisco. This portrait was taken sometime in the fall, I believe, of 1918. So uh, I don't think it would have happened without her determination. And I think uh, the, the suffrage movement, as I say, did, as you indicated, sort of steal her and give her greater confidence to, to ultimately prevail. And then, you know, I will say that it, it, they lived together at this point until 1944 when he died. So she didn't have those 20 some years together uh, with him. And the, the story you tell of the evolution to this next stage of the relationship is a fascinating one of, of two people who are so intertwined with their personal, their personal fascinations. Um, and I, I was really struck um, near the end of the, the book by how you so effectively characterize their life, especially in the Bay Area suburb of Los Gatos at their, um, so at the time, celebrated estate. When you, when you observed they wanted to transform their home and their very lives into works of art and the success they had in that. But I thought that's a, a really striking phrase. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, they did see themselves as poets. They saw poetry, writing poetry, to be the sort of highest level of human experience and what you should, you know, what you should do with your life if you possibly can. They were always writing about the truth and beauty and all these kinds of things, <clears throat> artistry. They cultivated friendships with literary people and artists, especially once they got together in San Francisco. Although Wood, from his early days, when he was living in New York City while he was going to law school, really always gravitated toward uh, artists and writers and so forth. So um, they, they, this was their idea of the, of the perfect life. Um, now, interestingly enough, they often justified their relationship on the basis of what would come of this is great poetry. You know, she thought Erskine was going to be the next Walt Whitman. He knew better. He knew he did not have that kind of talent. Um, but that was kind of how they, in part, how they justified the, the choices that they made. We're doing this for art. As it turned out, well, let me just back up for a second and say to the listeners there who are probably primarily in the Bay Area, uh, Wood came down for a short time. He lived in um, Corte Madera, but he had um, rented a house on Russian Hill for Sarah, where she had lived for many years. So he pretty soon comes over to Russian Hill. So they lived in Russian Hill and the, they rented one and then they bought one. And those houses are still there, by the way. And then by the 20s, um, the mid 20s, they moved down to this beautiful estate that's kind of between Los Gatos and Santa Cruz and the Santa Cruz Mountains. But their, their purpose from 1918 on was to try to put politics aside now. They had devoted a lot of time and treasure to that. But now they wanted to devote their lives that they could finally live together to poetry. And as it turned out, their poetry wasn't that good. Um, <laughs> really, sadly, he was no Walt Whitman. But you know, he um, did some pretty good stuff. And Sarah actually had some pretty interesting New York publishers for her work as well. But they were never going to be well known. and um, that was not going to be their mark uh, on life. But they had wonderful friends. Uh, just for a moment, I'd just like to mention some of the people that they knew from, from the political years, Emma Goldman and um, you know, Lincoln Steffens and, of course, Clarence Darrow I mentioned and Jack Reed and just, just all this cast of characters in their political years. And then, of course, in San Francisco, um, they got to know, particularly when they went to Los Gatos, Robinson Jeffers. 
uh, and uh, so they would have these wonderful parties at the at the cats, as they called it, with with these literary figures. And one of my favorite moments actually was when Lincoln Steffens came to to see them there, and he said to them, "You know, um, what you have created here is really this is beauty. This is art." And it was in the way in which they had created this lovely life in Los Gatos that was probably their greatest sort of achievement in terms of trying to reach for a model of how to live a life that is beautiful, um, that has at its core uh, production of art. And, and so um, they had many happy years there. Uh, I, I think when Arskin had his 73rd birthday, he said something like, um, you know, it all turned out okay. And I think I make a little comment that, well, yes, you know, it did for you. I'm not so sure uh, that everybody, the spouses would have agreed, but they do uh, finally achieve personal happiness and satisfaction when they live together, uh, particularly in Los Gatos. And so this is kind of unusual. Let me just say it's a moment of thing. A lot of people look at these free love relationships and say they were doomed. They were not successful, but this is one um, that actually was successful if you look at longevity and, and that sort of thing um, as success. Well, and one of the things I really appreciate is your, I, I don't want to um, necessarily say complete dispassion because you clearly are very invested in the story, you're invested in the people, but you have a, a lovely capacity for standing back and saying in a sort of Hemingway-esque fashion after Sarah or CES has gone on and on for pages of, of philosophical meanderings. <laughs> well, it would be pretty to think so. Um, but you, you have a, a genuine investment in them that allows you a capacity to, to speak to them uh, in terms of, of their strivings, which is in many ways, all any of us can do. And I, I really like um, what is, I, I think it's your concluding um, sentences. Their love was not always beautiful and it was never perfect, but it was vital, full, and sometimes brave. Mm. I think that is, is just fabulous. <laughs> I think that- Well, thank you, Peter. Just. Uh brings their story to such a, a point. Well, I pretty early on discovered when I would talk to other people that people would respond very strongly to them and often not like them. And that it surprised me in a way because they didn't even know very much about them, but they didn't like, there was something about the story they didn't, they, I'm not gonna like, I don't like this person. So, um, what happened with me was obviously I liked them to begin with or I wouldn't have spent all this time. As I began to learn more about them and see how valuable they could be and things they could do that I did not like. There were things about them I did not like. But when it came to writing this story, I didn't want to tell people what to think. Now that was also sort of a new departure for me as you know, as an academic historian, you're supposed to have an argument, you know, an interpretation, you want everybody to see it your way and you marshal the evidence. This was something very different. I wanted to tell the story and actually do what you, what you said back away, try to tell the story as honestly as I could, but let people decide for themselves where they come down on this. Because that I think in the end is the value of the story. These are people who are taking chances and risks and making choices that some of us have made and some of us have been too afraid to make. Um, but they also thought about it. They thought about it deeply. And they left this rich record that helps us track it and think of, and watch as they make these changes and choices. And you think, oh my gosh. And then and then other times you think, wow, I, I really admire them for this. So that is, I think, what I'm trying to convey. I want to help people understand them. Uh, they don't have to like them. That's okay. But I think that if they stick with it, they will find the story interesting, they will reflect upon their own choices, and um, then it can be of, of some value there. And then finally, the other part of this is that I do believe that it does transport you back 100 years and gives you a sense of what it was like to be in the suffrage movement, what it was like to try to be involved in a free love listed as affair, what it was like to go to 
support and defend free speech, which Erskine does, you know, I think uh, very bravely. So there are mo moments when they are both very brave and there are other moments when they are just uh, exasperating and not very attractive people, like most of us. <laughs> well, I, there are a million um, more points that I would love to bring up, but I think it's time for us to turn to Laura to see about uh, reaching out to our listeners for some questions. Yeah, so um, if you've got questions uh, for Sherry and also for Peter, please put your questions in the chat. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna come up with our, with the first query. Two things, first of all, you know, um, Erskine had, in, had introduced Sarah into writing and being a journalist with the Portland paper. And I'm just wondering if her journalism continued through her suffrage work um, in San Francisco and beyond. And then the other question was, did they have any interaction with Eugene O'Neill and his wife? Because they were in San Francisco. They were also at the Dow House in Danville. I'm just wondering if they had any connection with them. I'll answer the first, the second question first. As far as I know, no, they never, I mean, if they had, I would have certainly paid attention. Uh, there was def no correspondence, uh, no mention of him as far as I know. So I don't know why not, but uh, they did not as far as I know. In terms of the journalism gambit, that was actually the first effort for Sarah to try to see if she could have a profession um, away from her husband. And this was the famous McNamara trial in um, 1911 and Sarah's sister was a journalist and so she was going to be covering the trial so Sarah went down there to live with her but frankly the money for, for Sarah's expenses were being paid I'm pretty sure by Erskine and she um, she was really not very good at it she was rather wooden and um, you know and actually the, the, the trial ended up being um, well they, they to the McNamara brothers said that they were guilty, so the trial ne never even went to the trial phase. She was only there to cover jury selection and so on. So she, she felt sort of frustrated by it. She didn't think she was very good, and she wasn't very good. So she decided journalism was probably not going to be her profession. When she had to go to Nevada for uh, the divorce and, and stay there for a while, she did a little bit of journalism there that was published. But um, I think she, she realized that she was no Mary Field, her very um, talented sister journalist, and that instead she would do the, the suffrage movement. Um, also, how many signatures were they able to accrue during their cross-country petition? And then what kind of celebrity came out of that arriving in Washington and also with the national movements? Just a little more detail about that. And so since we just finished our Suffrage 100 celebration. Yes. You know, I do not know how many signatures they actually um, got. And I wonder where that is now. But she claimed it was over four miles long. So there were quite a few. And as they were going across the continent, they would stop in places like Salt Lake City and Cheyenne, Wyoming uh, and uh, Chicago and gather additional signatures as they went along. So, but, but really the, the brilliance of that whole thing was not so much the petition and the signatures, but the fact that this was just a phenomenal thing to do. I mean, this was a wild and crazy adventure that attracted a good deal of attention from the media. So Sarah became something of a media celebrity all across the country. People were tracking this crazy woman's uh, uh, adventure here. And so by the time she got to New York City, New York was even interested in going out and seeing this car. I mean, this was a big, big deal. Her children uh, kept a scrapbook of all of the articles that had been written about her. So, and she went and met President Wilson. So yes, yeah, she, she could have actually built on that in fact, Alice Paul would have been delighted to have her stay in Washington, D.C., because she was not only a very skillful orator, but her um, audience was ready to write checks. She was great at fundraising as well. But, you know, she wanted to be with Erskine. And she wanted to go back to California and try to bring him down. So she didn't really pursue the celebrity that she had gained from this um, expedition. But I will say this, that it has not been forgotten. And I don't know if your viewers have seen the PBS 
series called The Vote. It's a four hour documentary about suffrage. At the very beginning of part two, they start with Sarah leaving the uh, exposition grounds in San Francisco and they spend a number of minutes on this. So she has been remembered uh, for this trip for sure. Uh, let's see, uh, anything else that you asked me about that? Or that yeah, I, I think right now I'm gonna let Pam um, take over and read some of the questions that are in the chat. So um, Pam, well, there's, take a, there's a question um, from Sinbad. I'm curious whether they had any connections with Jack London's social circle another openly public proponent of the free love movement at the time. Well, Peter, um, you know, of course, the Huntington has a gigantic uh, Jack London collection, and Sue Hutchin, who happens to be your wife, has written about Jack London. Um, would you like to take a crack at this one? Do you know about this? Well, I remember that uh, um, certainly Wood traveled in many of the same circles. I don't know that they had many uh, connections. I'm sure that London, especially in his yours for the revolution phase, would have admired certain aspects of what they undertook. But at the same time, CES's corduroy suit, you know, four, four square pocket, you know, artwork and so forth would have given him pause. Um, and it would really actually be very interesting for someone, uh, possibly my dear spouse, who I think is sitting in on, uh, on tonight's uh, festivities to actually look into that because, you know, Wood is that other generation uh, that slightly older generation, and it would be interesting to to think what did he think of one of Wood's works like Poet in the Desert or, um, you know, similar things. London was always a man in a hurry, though, so he, he usually didn't stop to think too much about anybody else. He, he was pushing forward to the, you know, the next book um, so he could get the next payment. Uh, of royalties. Yeah, uh, I mean, you would expect that their paths had crossed, but I have no, um, again, no documentation of that having happened. Um, he was very, very well connected with the New York Bohemians of Greenwich Village, actually, from his New York days and so on. So he knew Max Eastman and, you know, all that crowd. Uh, more than he seemed to hang out with uh, Jack London, which is interesting. I'd never thought about that before, but that's a really interesting question, but I, I found no evidence of uh, any relationship there. I, it would be if interesting. Sue is on, she can write something in the chat. <laughs> it would be interesting to, to do a, a backdoor look too and see if John Reed and Louise Bryant, two radicals focused in the um, Portland area, made any, any sort of backdoor type of connections. But of course, by that point, we're coming down towards the the point past Jack London's life. So, can Sabe? Right. Well, there's a question from Barbara. Was their free love experiment successful in that Wood had several other relationships, but Sarah remained monogamous? <laughs> Okay, I have to tell you, that's my sister who has read this book. And <laughs> so thank you, Barbara. Um, and that really was a huge issue uh, between uh, Sarah and Erskine. What does free love mean within the dynamics of the relationship? And Erskine's position was free love means free, um, but he was not promiscuous. Um, but never, but he was not going to promise to remain true to only one sexual partner. And it was really only when they were apart, which was long stretches of time, that he would have somebody else. He had he was kind of a serial, I don't know, lover. So he had a number of different relationships, uh, even after he and Sarah, although he always told her she was number one. And at first she tried really hard to convince him that this was not the way to go. Uh, she just really had a hard time with that, but he was not going to give. He was not going to give. So she kind of had to just accept it. And so there, there were two women in particular 
um, that he had engaged relationships with in Portland while she was down in California or back east working on suffrage. Um, he would tell her about it eventually. He often wasn't forthcoming at the beginning. And she would become upset, but in the end, it was just something that she had to accept. She had really no interest in other men. There were other men who were interested in her, and she would certainly tell Wood about them, hoping, I think, to get him jealous, uh, but, but he knew that she was really um, not likely to uh, create a relationship with another man, but he told her, if you did, I think I'll be big enough to be able to accept it. So that was a big issue between the two of them. Once they came, once he came to San Francisco, then that just totally evaporated. It was no longer a source of tension. Um, Anne Marie asks, are there living descendants that remember them? Did you interview any of them? I should, actually, Peter has met some of them, but I'll just answer this fairly quickly. I uh, have met several of them, great, great granddaughters, actually, and they did not, uh, know them. Although actually Sarah, I have to say Sarah Woodsmith did know Sarah Bardfield and I did talk with her. Um, but the other Woods that I met um, did not know them. And actually, I mean, I'm pretty sure I think I know a lot more than they do. But it would have been great, you know, to talk to people who actually did know them and interacted with them. And I would have gotten some, I'm sure, value out of that. Uh, so, but Peter has actually, you met Sarah's daughter, right, Peter? Actually, I, I worked with Kay Caldwell um, in the 1990s. So um, she's Sarah's daughter. Yes, so and Sarah's thank daughter. you, Sherry. Yeah. Um, and actually, uh, Kay was doing some earthquake renovating in their house, um, the house that she and her husband Jim Caldwell had occupied for so long. He was uh, Berkeley faculty, right, Sherry? Yes. Um, and uh, she found a significant cache of materials, which she generously gave to the Huntington, and it became the CES Wood collection addenda, which Sherry fortunately was able to use in the collection. And uh, uh, Kay was a fascinating individual. I, I made much less of it than Sherry would have um, but it was still um, a marvelous opportunity to hear from her about POPs, which was the term that she and uh, her brother Albert um, used to refer to CES. Um, and I got hints of the sometimes tenuous relationship between um, Kay and Sarah, and it it was personally it was it was it was rewarding for me to hear of how they had in their time come to a, a place of repose um, between the t between each other and the. Kay and, and Sarah were able to establish uh, what sounded like a, a rewarding and uh, I think loving relationship, but it was not, it was not easy. <laughs> and to hear that from someone in that moment when, was really striking. Um, Jody Stephenson asks, what were their thoughts on religion? Uh, Wood was an atheist, will not shock people um, to learn that about him. He was actually fiercely anti-Catholic uh, because his wife was Catholic. And when they were, before they got married, he just wrote her this incredible letter from the West uh, about all the things that were wrong with Catholicism and so forth. And, and I think it was because her family was saying that if you marry this guy, you have to raise your children Catholic. But so, you know, to him, this is sort of the worst abuse of power, the Catholic Church, and so on and so forth. So he was not interested in religion at all. And Sarah, as I say, was raised Baptist and had you know, been married to a Baptist minister. But when that relationship crumbled, uh, she left the church. And um, later in life, got very interested in um, uh, Eastern uh, religions um, and found some solace in that. But for the most part, um, 
she put religion aside. I, I would like to just say one thing, if I can, uh, back about Kay, the daughter. Um, of all of the characters in this book, and it sometimes reads like a novel, so that's why I'm using that word. Uh, she was the one who I think had the most difficult time because she was so young and she was torn between her parents and she witnessed some terrible things. And um, so I'm not surprised that she was left with some pretty deep scars. But, but Sarah herself believed that they had made some progress uh, later on in life in, in repairing some of that damage. And one of the interesting things is that Wood's son, whose name was also Erskine, was really always very straight with his father. He thought his father had done a very terrible thing to his mother. And so he was never very friendly to Sarah until after his mother died. And then you know, he felt he could put his loyalty to his mother to rest. But even so, there was tension in that relationship, big time between Erskine and his son. But later in life, after Erskine, the father had died, Erskine, the son was looking at old letters and he wrote one to Sarah in like 1970. And he said, now I feel so badly that I hadn't really done more to understand my father. And this was a letter that was in that collection that Peter was talking about that Kay brought to him many years after the original collection was given to the Huntington. And she and Kay wrote on this in her handwriting, this letter was of inestimable value to my mother. So, you know, in, in the end, the families found some reconciliation, some moments of genuine connection and forgiveness, I would even say, for what had happened. So sorry about that, but I wanted to add that to Peter's comments. Okay, Sinbad has another question. Any indications from your research regarding the attribution of the famous quote from Chief Joseph to CES Wood? This is a, a question that has been asked before, and there is debate about what role did Wood play in actually creating at least part of the rhetoric of that uh, Joseph speech. Where I come down on this is I do believe he embellished Whatever it was that Chief Joseph said when he was surrendering, he certainly said something. But Wood really made a point of seeking him out and befriending him and talking to him about his family and so forth right after the surrender. He really admired Chief Joseph. And he, as I have indicated, was a, you know, he was a closet poet. And so I do believe he had something to do with some of those poetic flourishes to where the sun now stands, I will fight no more for forever. But there is really, in the end, no way to absolutely prove that. And, and Wood himself denied that he insisted that these were the very words that Chief Joseph said. But others that were there said he didn't really say very much at all. So I don't know. I don't know. I guess Wood did not want to take away from, from Chief Joseph by maybe suggesting that he had, you know, added a little flourish here and there. It, it, you have to think the more you read, uh, especially in, in Sherry's book, of course, where there are generous quotations from writings by both Sarah and CES, the more you, you immerse yourself in CES Wood's rhetoric, the more easily you can, you can almost see CES standing there, that dashing cavalier um, with the you know, the cape and the kepi and everything, you know, practicing, hear me, my chiefs. Um, you know, it, it, it has that Victorian flourish of eloquence and rhetoric, but I agree, there's no way to, to be absolutely certain, but it would be nice in some ways to think he did because he, he that message has resonated for so long with so many Americans that it would really be nice to to think that our our man CES had at least a little influence in in bringing that kind of sentiment to the fore for how Americans view um, First Nation peoples. Now, at the time, of course, he had no idea that this would become famous. Uh, so uh, I think he just really wanted to convey to whoever read this, this is what's happening here, and this is a human being. And you know, he wanted to get some of his own emotional reactions to what had been 
happening, and including through his discussions with Joseph, I think, to put them down on paper. So I think, uh, but I don't think he ever imagined that we would be talking about it in 2020. So, uh, but that has been in fact the, the effect of whoever penned it or played with it uh, really has helped uh, the cause for sure. I, Do we I have just time wanna... for any more or? Um, well, actually, we're, we're going to have to wrap up right now. But first of all, I just wanted to say that uh, for our audiences, Sherry's book is an intimate and beautifully written portrait of these very iconic, larger than life uh, personalities and uh, what they had to give to each other and also what they gave to the world in their, in their own way in their time. Uh, but I highly recommend the book. I'm enjoying it. And of course, once again, if you can purchase your book at one of our independent um, bookstores, alexanderbook.com um, would be our choice as it's right near Mechanics Institute and our vendor. But I really appreciate uh, both having author Sherry Smith and Dr. Peter Blodgett with us to explore these two lives. And uh, we thank you for coming and please join us again. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you All for right. a lovely time. <laughs>